I read that you met uh, Lenny Tristano while he was playing with a, a Mexican band in, in Chicago. Uh, that's a fact, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'd love to hear Lenny Tristano with a Mexican band. Well, uh, <laughs> they were just playing you know, Latin rhythms right. and things like that, and he was doing something different. But mm -hmm. then uh, we talked a little bit, and uh, I, I played a tune with him, and uh, he kind of was uh, making fun of what I was doing. Really? I, I don't know if I was 12 years old or 15 or 17 or something like that, but I was just starting to try to play that kind of music, and uh, it's not easy, you know. <laughs> was it at that time he said, uh, let's get together, and was it a, for, a formal student-teacher type relationship? Yeah, I, or? I told him I'd really appreciate uh, his help, and uh, it was very inspiring for me, and I appreciated that. Uh, but I've always found it hard in a big band situation to uh, try to uh, enable the note-to-note -note improvisation because I know I have uh, perhaps a chorus. Yeah. Uh, I know the saxophones are coming in with a background on the bridge. Yeah, it's and difficult. then there's going to be some kind of send-off <laughs> to end my solo and go into the next chorus. And uh, so I, uh, unfortunately, I tend to find things, especially in those, if it's an AABA song, the last 16 bars that I know will work. Yeah, yeah. So that I don't feel like I've failed at when the brass comes in and leads into the next solo. So how do you, uh, how did you deal with that at that time? Well, I, I just came out uh, having heard what the band played just before me and uh, went from there. I had no real plan. And uh, that includes uh, how to get out of it and everything. <laughs> Sometimes I, I tiptoed off, you know. Yeah. But uh, uh, that's the way uh, I got my most uh, fun out of the act of playing. If it really felt like I was making something up a little bit, it didn't right. have to be a genius, a genius uh, just a kind of fresh and some mostly fresh then because mm -hmm. we're listening to charlie parker you heard all these great things over and over again dizzy gillespie and all these guys that right. uh, developed their <clears throat> ways of playing personally we're stuck with it in some way i think you feel the pressure from the the audience or the record buyers to uh, yeah, yeah. continue in a certain way i think and, so uh, yeah and uh, that kind of uh, loses the the the, uh, the thrill of uh, hearing something that you didn't plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember with Stan Kenton, uh, uh, just a, a little story that maybe you can, if you have some similar recollections. Uh, I played with Stan for almost three years. We were still doing one-nighters. We had two weeks off at Christmas. And I remember him yelling at the soloists oh. uh, if they didn't play something new every night. Oh, yeah? It was almost like, uh, and I, I hesitate to use sports analogies, but this one is, is appropriate, benching a player who's underperforming to just to give him a little rest. Stan would take the solos away from a saxophone player or from a trombone player and give it to the uh, other guy. Oh, good. And uh, tell him, yeah, you know, you have to like uh, spend some time thinking about creativity and perhaps let these phrases that I'm hearing every night uh, leave your yeah. Your, your uh, being, and then you can come up with something huh. new. And, I never uh, heard that from him. Uh, yeah. I appreciate uh, hearing that from you. Right? Yeah, no, he was, and I worked with some other big band leaders from the, the same era, and they actually wanted more planned kind of show big biz solos, and that's why I didn't stay with those bands for very long. Uh, I actually took uh, Charlie Venturo's place on the Claude Tor No, it wasn't Claude Thorne. This was the Teddy <laughs> Powell band. Okay. And, uh, uh, I had a tenor saxophone and a bass clarinet that I brought to the gig and a regular B-flat clarinet. And one, to, one uh, late afternoon, uh, we were playing uh, outdoors, this kind of session, and I had a solo to play, the first solo with the band. And I stood up and played some version of Body and Soul, I think, or whatever. And I was told afterwards that Teddy Powell was uh, in the wings, hitting his head against the stage. <laughs> <laughs> and I think he hit a nail. And I was <laughs> wow. Well, uh, anyway, uh, that was tough. Uh, 
Well, could you elaborate a little more on note-to-note uh, -note improvisation? You know, when we're playing tempos, even ballad tempos, uh, and the, the basic uh, syntax of the, the way we make melodies is, is in eighth notes, those notes come very quickly after one another. And I think, uh, you know, the, the goal is to, to try to keep it as improvised as possible. Uh, but you, more than anyone that I've ever heard, uh, I feel that every note is a new note. Uh, oh, thank and, you. Wow, uh, boy. And uh, I, I mean, I uh, sit on the edge of my seat when I hear certain people play because it's like a thriller to me of what's going to happen next in the suspense. And that's, okay. that's uh, I'm sitting back on this seat now. But when you start to play, I'll sit on the edge of my seat <laughs> because you never know it's what's... It's not that you want to get out of here quick. No, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm just uh, excited by the, uh, the, you know, the, the possibilities of what will come next. So, uh, where did that first uh, in in your playing and your development, uh, uh, you know, the light came on and said, "I just don't want to play phrases that I know I can play. I want to take the chance that every note is a new note." Uh, before I decided that, I think uh, it was a matter of, of the way I functioned. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I uh, tried to make a philosophy about it to some extent. I didn't uh, just decide that I, I had to play something original or something. I mm. uh, had that in, in the front of my mind, I think. But uh, right. I tried to start from scratch, mm. I guess, uh, each time. Who were the, the players you were listening to at that time? Um, that, that you felt were improvising one note at a time or trying to be as spontaneous well, uh, as possible? Well, most of the people that I were listening to, uh, was, was listening to, uh, were playing things that they prepared, mm -hmm. uh, basically, I think. Right. Uh, Roy Eldridge was one of the people that I loved very much. And uh, uh, I think uh, he had his supply of, of uh, uh, spiritual lifting phrases and mm -hmm. things like that. But uh, also, I think uh, if he got uh, stoned enough, he could uh, make <laughs> up new phrases. <laughs> what about, uh, well, and this happens, of course, when, when uh, musicians play in big bands, they're given these short periods. And yeah. uh, I remember hearing the Ellington Band in 72, and Cootie Williams played the, the same solos that I'd heard on records from the, the, you know, the yeah. 30s. But what about Lester Young, as far as fresh, improvising fresh ideas. Well, uh, I didn't uh, know uh, him in that, at that period. I saw him once, not even knowing I was going to hear him and see him at a theater on the south side of Chicago. And uh, I was uh, very moved by what I heard. But after that, it was just basically records. Mm -hmm. And uh, the records were... Uh, seemingly fresh uh, all the time. He uh, has become, over the years, uh, I think my favorite uh, soloist and player, because it always feels like he's really in control of the situation without having mapped it out, mm -hmm. planned it. I, I've listened to some of the records that have uh, duplicate takes and right. things from different concerts, and I hear similar phrases, but uh, he's making something different right. out of them most of the time, not right. just going through the routine. And the sound was, in, his sound was incredible. The sound was glorious. Yeah. 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 Well, when I listen to you and Warren play, when, and it's just uh, the, the, the records that, that Lee and Warren Marsh made with Lenny Tristano, it's just incredible. The, uh, it sounds like three people all thinking the same way about music. Well, it was a great... Uh, uh, listening experience, mm -hmm. basically. Well, everybody was more interested in what the next guy was doing in some way. Uh, that helps to focus the attention in the right uh, direction, I think. Right. I mean, when I hear you guys play the, the heads on some of those lines, like, wow, and, uh, you know, you and Warren together, it, it sounds like uh, one person playing an instrument that has all of the qualities of the tenor and the alto mm. together. And it's... Uh, it felt nice, I know. But uh, I've been spending uh, all of these years afterwards 
trying to eliminate as many of those notes as possible. <laughs> How's that going? <laughs> boo, 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 boo. It goes fine. You, know, you can yeah. take a breath and yeah. can enjoy the note more. Going 100 miles mm -hmm. an hour becomes uh, some way automatic and uh, less rewarding, I right, think, right. Uh, uh, ultimately. Um, talk about rhythm sections a little bit. I, uh, I was listening the other day to the, rec the recordings from the half note that are under your name with Warren Marsh and Bill Evans and uh, Jimmy Garrison on the bass. Uh, yeah, yeah. And Paul Motion. Yeah. And I was thinking that you're playing, uh, you stepped out of a dream and uh, there's a bass solo. And I don't think I'd ever heard Jimmy Garrison play uh, on a recording. Uh, a solo over changes. I'm mostly familiar with him, of course, with Ornette and, uh, and uh, John Coltrane. Uh, and there with, with Train, his, his solos were basically free solos, uh, unaccompanied, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, uh, and I love those, those things. But I was really, it was really interesting to hear him play over, over changes. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, it's, you know, I could hear the Paul Chambers influence and uh, the note choice was very, uh, very incredible. So I'm wondering, how was that, uh, uh, I don't know, it's, it seems funny to ask, but how was that decision made? How was Jimmy Garrison chosen for those, for those gigs? Had you been playing with him for, uh, in other situations? Just, uh, you know, at a session maybe or something. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody knew about, I mean, most of us knew about his availability and he happened to be available. Mm -hmm. And he and Paul uh, were a great team, uh, right. so it made it... A uh, special, uh, special communication, I think. Yeah. And then Lenny uh, said that he was taking some time off. I think this was a number of weeks uh, continuous engagement at the old half note. Right. And uh, so Bill Evans came in uh, at least one night and uh, was very uh, respectful and, you know, uh, laid out a lot and... Uh, Whenever we were out of tune with each other, he laid out, let me have it. <laughs> Say, oh, Jesus. One thing I wanted to bring up was the free playing with, with Lenny, uh, intuition and digression. Mm. And in a lot of uh, jazz history books, this is called the first uh, free jazz recordings. And it was, it was so different from the other material on that record. Um, was there anything decided in advance or of... Uh, any kind of instructions? Uh, to have a poke before we did it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I guess I knew what that meant, but uh, <laughs> we needed the visual. Uh, Confession time, folks. <laughs> but it, it was not, uh, uh, you know, uh, life-threatening. To me, because uh, all I needed was like one poke of uh, good uh, grass, and I felt uh, like uh, I could improvise. Mm -hmm. It was built in some way. Some something was uh, removed from the planning uh, aspect, and I could just go from the first note and uh, add another new note or whatever. Mm -hmm. It was always very fascinating to me, and that's. What happened there? Uh, we uh, decided at a rehearsal that we just to play without any plans, and it felt great, mm -hmm. it felt very rewarding, and so we did it a number of times uh, in public, and then uh, it got a little bit uh, difficult in public uh, with the consistency. Uh, so uh, we went back to just playing on tunes. Uh, mm -hmm. But that was entirely improvised. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Amazing. Uh, you know, three minutes, four minutes of free jazz at that time. I mean, yeah. it's, still, it's still amazing. Yeah, I always uh, am amazed listening back <laughs> to uh, that. I think we did four short takes, uh, and uh, I think just two of them were released. <clears throat> I was listening also to uh, the duets record that you did in the, the late 60s. I think 67 was released in 68, Lee, Lee Konitz duets with, uh, with uh, each track is with different, different uh -huh. people. Dick Katz, Marshall Brown, the, oh, yeah. the trombonist. 
uh, there's a, a suite of, uh, of uh, versions of You Don't Know What Love Is with uh, Carl Berger on vibes and uh -huh. Norman Elvin. And, uh -huh. uh, and then at the end of the record, everyone comes together and uh, has this incredible, uh, uh, it sounds like a tonal version of Coltrane's, uh, Coltrane's Ascension, where uh -huh. there's uh, many horns and uh, massive rhythm. Uh -huh. uh, but it sounds a little more organized, and uh, I find it's, it's a, a fascinating, a fascinating record. Uh -huh. um, I have to listen to that again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a, a real gift for us uh, who uh, are lucky enough to make uh, some meaningful uh, recorded music and to be able to listen to it like 50 years later uh, and still uh, say, wow, you know, that was interesting. It's a big uh, reward. Uh, <clears throat> and you've always, you've always liked playing in uh, duet situations. Later this afternoon, uh, you have a long-term relationship with uh, pianist Dan Tepfer. Yeah. And um, uh, playing in duets, it, with, whether it's a piano or in this case of the record, uh, drums in some cases, or you did a duet with Joe Henderson on tenor saxophone. Um, how is that different than playing with, with a, you know, a more normal uh, instrumentation with uh, bass and drums and some kind of comping instrument? Uh, you know, when a good rhythm section is playing, they're really establishing the way they feel the rhythm. And we are uh, delighted to join in, but uh, most of the times we don't change the <laughs> that up too much. We don't change where they put it because mm -hmm. they're putting it right where it should be, let's say. Right. And uh, just to ride along uh, and get involved in that is a, a big enough a, a reward. The playing uh, without a rhythm signal, what we're doing this afternoon is, uh, 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 you know, really, uh, uh, almost totally free because Dan is a great listener and I, uh, I love to listen and uh, sometimes I can't concentrate enough to really hear the subtlety of the music. I heard the record that I made years ago with uh, uh, the bass player of the brothers, uh, uh, Heath. Oh, uh, Percy Heath. Percy Heath right. was the bass player. And uh, I swear, for the number of years that I listened occasionally to that record, I hardly ever tuned in to how well he was playing that bass line. And all of a sudden, a few days ago, I put it on and I heard the whole thing. I wasn't stoned or anything. <laughs> <laughs> and it was beautiful, I, you know. <laughs> and, uh, I'm, you know, my point about that is that that's really the way uh, all of, our, uh, of us as listeners uh, relate in, in various ways to the value of the music. Uh, I, I hear people saying, whoa, I listen to that every day for years, you know. I say, how can you do that, you know? Mm. And now I'm doing more of that, you know. Yeah. It's very yeah. rewarding. There's always something to hear with a quartet. Just listen to what the bass is playing. Et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's what I noticed when I was listening to the, uh, the half note records with Jimmy Garrison. I played You Stepped Out of a Dream over and over and was focusing on how he uh, attacked those chord changes because I'm so familiar with his playing, but not perhaps in that, uh, that situation. And of course, on the record Motion, I'd like to bring that up uh, because, uh, you know, it's uh, Sonny Dallas on bass and Elvin Jones on the drums. And I think it's fascinating to listen to Elvin play on this record because you immediately can tell it's Elvin Jones, but yeah. hearing him in a little different uh, different way of yeah. playing. He was playing with Coltrane the night before and uh, you know uh, we played the first tune at nine o'clock in the morning I think as the trio with Sonny and uh, like the first beat he knew exactly what to do. Yeah. And then, of course, you asked him to do one of the versions of uh, You Don't Know What Love Is on the duets record, and that um, is incredible also. You should go back and listen to that record. Uh, 
Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, I'm uh, going through my collection of CDs and things right now and uh, trying to, and I just came across a record uh, that I never even saw before that, <laughs> that was really nice, you know, and I couldn't remember where it was made or anything yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of sounding a little bit stupid, but uh, that's part of, of uh, this letting the music uh, be part of a uh, lifetime, you know. That sometimes uh, you forget things or whatever. I'd like to talk a little bit about the sound you get on the alto saxophone. And, uh, oh, there it is. Um, alto saxophone with the sound. If I'm listening to somebody who has a great sound on their horn, but they're playing a bunch of wrong notes over the changes, it's totally okay with me because I'm a melodic weirdo, but if it's a great sound, I can, I can take the, uh, perhaps the wrong notes and the dissonant notes. And uh, I hear people like Joe Lovano, and of course, he doesn't fall into that category of playing wrong notes. I mean, he's, uh, he's playing wrong notes on purpose, but he makes them sound right. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons that uh, he gets such a great sound on the saxophone, one of the reasons those, the kind of the dissonant notes are uh, readily acceptable is because he's got such a great sound and that enables him to kind of be creative in a, in a chromatic way. Your sound, you know, people develop their sounds uh, sometimes without even knowing it, but what was your uh, method for developing the sound? Was it a well, Lester I think, Young influence? Uh, maybe first Johnny Hodges. He was a lovely ballad player and got that uh, lovely sound, I mm -hmm. think. In my way, I tried to duplicate that. Playing eighth notes, you know, using the tongue very rapidly, I think that's a, a problem that I have as a trumpet player. Many trumpet players have is the, the tongue kind of destroys uh, wait a the minute. airstream. Uh, I uh, thought that I was unusual in uh, playing uh, more legato than a lot of people. Right, right. That's what I was uh, going to ask you about your your tonguing method on the alto saxophone. Uh -huh. That doesn't at all uh, sound like you're tonguing yeah, and doesn't well, uh, not, doesn't a lot, doesn't destroy the sound at all, you know. But uh, lately, uh, you know, uh, uh, it ain't over until it's over, folks. <laughs> so I'm doing tonguing exercises now. Da 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 da. <clears throat> something to keep in contact with the reed. How do you go about practicing? Well, uh, first thing I'm doing uh, in these uh, latter days is uh, shortening the practice time. <laughs> <laughs> so I can get done in 15 minutes what it used to take me two hours to do. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if there's something that uh, I'm trying to learn, uh, uh, a line that uh, Tristano wrote, uh, uh, years ago, and it's very complex to kind of remember 32 bars, eight notes uh, sometimes. And uh, I just uh, have to go over it, singing it and playing it, uh, mostly slowly. What are some of your influences outside music that inspire you? Uh, well, uh, my wife is one. Uh, and uh, you know, we just did a four-day uh, tour up in uh, Albuquerque and Phoenix. I mean, you know, if you can say those words, you, you got half, half a view of the mountains uh, that are there. And uh, that's uh, always uh, very uh, rewarding, uh, playing uh, modestly, usually with uh, maybe this number of people or less, and uh, they, uh, you know, uh, seem to enjoy it most of the time, uh, to a standing ovation, and, and that's uh, such a pleasure. I never get uh, too much of that uh, <laughs> validation. Usually, uh, uh, my taste is uh, in uh, a genuine, uh, uh, spontaneous expression of the music. Uh, it's all the right ingredients, the right volume of the players listening to each other and each, you know, all the things you have to do to have a good conversation. There's a musical conversation that you'll hear 
uh, in a few minutes when we when Dan and I play. Sometimes off the bandstand, we sound like a couple idiots. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm talking about myself. <laughs> But uh, with the music, uh, you have a special language, and uh, it's amazing how uh, it can uh, develop into something meaningful. Uh, sir, I was wondering, what was your favorite venue to play in? There are a number of places that were always a pleasant surprise. Uh, we could play with the right, uh, especially the duos or quartets, without amplification against the the rules of the man who was in charge of the microphones and everything, but afterwards he'd come up and say, yeah, that was enough, you know, it was fine. Uh, in New York, uh, Birdland is one of my favorite places to play in uh, for the sound and uh, just the feeling of the club. Oh, Lord, there have been many, many places over the years that have been uh, just perfect sound places. And I have a bunch of records that uh, were recorded there that I'm trying to collect and uh, find a way to, to release uh, eventually some of the nice concerts that happen in those situations. When you and your colleagues came to the realization that you wanted to play what was referred to later as free jazz, was this uh, something within the context of harmonic and rhythmic structures or just anything that came into anybody's mind? Well, uh, I mean, these first pieces that we talked about, the uh, intuition uh, with Tristano, uh, was just uh, uh, no real discussion, uh, just starting to play and react to each other. And that was, uh, that was always a miracle to me. And uh, uh, many of the young guys, I'm... Uh, venturing to, to say this, uh, heard that music and were, to some degree, inspired uh, by what we were doing and uh, were loath to uh, give us a nod. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a drag. You know what I mean? I'm just wondering, I've been hearing a lot about free jazz, and I, and I always thought of Lee Konitz as the sort of king of cool jazz. Could you compare cool jazz and free jazz? Uh, good free jazz is cool jazz. <laughs> <laughs> Thank it's, you. It's been my uh, honor to sit here next to you, as always. Likewise. And uh, we'll uh, take a little break and then uh, have some wild eighth notes. Free and cool wild eighth notes. Lee Conan. Thank <laughs> you. 